happy, uh, thank you for inviting me to come talk about uh, a topic dear to my heart, which is poverty in the United States and policies to reduce it. Uh, and uh, everything I'm going to talk about here is uh, very U.S. oriented, but I hope during the Q&A we can talk about relevance to Canada. We hope that some of our proposals here are, are relevant to other countries. And of course, everything is very context specific, and the U.S. has some very specific both programs and kind of perspective on how to address poverty, and that'll obviously come come out here. Okay, so um, what I'm going to talk about here is a report which was issued back in February by the National Academies of Science in the United States, and I was a member of the committee. I'll show you the membership in a second. Uh, but it's a result of a mandate by Congress to study uh, child poverty in the United States. Child poverty, not overall poverty. That's important. We'll come out, come to that uh, pretty clearly here. Uh, and uh, we were mandated uh, as a committee, the National Academy was mandated to try to find policies that would reduce child poverty by 50 percent within 10 years. And I'm going to come back to the very specifics of that because we, uh, we had to stick to exactly what we were asked to do and not other things. We had a very specific goal. The National Academies of Science, if you don't know, is a very old institution in the United States. It was formed in the middle of the 19th, uh, 19th century, and it is an organization which is, whose goal is to provide expert uh, a, a guidance and advice mainly to the uh, administration, to the executive branch. Occasionally you have Congress asking the National Academy to study something. The National Academy has a bunch of staff, but they don't have any experts on hand. Whenever they're asked to study a topic and provide expert advice, they bring in experts on that from around the country and around the world, in fact, to study that and issue a report. And this committee was in that, of that type. Okay, so here's the, uh, the, the committee that was assessed to um, uh, form to uh, address the charge. Uh, had a lot of people from a lot of different perspectives, both political perspectives, some people from uh, economics, sociologists, uh, developmental psychologists, uh, demographers, uh, a lot of different kinds of people here uh, were on the committee who brought different kinds of expertise to bear. I should say that uh, we do have a very, very short uh, uh, section of the report comparing poverty rates in the United States to other countries, and uh, you can read that. Uh, fellow Tim Smeeting here, I know many of you know him, was very important in uh, uh, writing that section, and uh, it, uh, I'll say a little bit about it, but not a whole lot uh, when I get to it. So anyway, I really enjoyed working with the other people in this committee, and uh, all really uh, good people, uh, myself accepted. So anyway, uh, statement of task here, uh, statement of task charge. And one of the things about National Academy uh, committees is you're told to look at this and do not let yourself wander around and kind of talk about other things that you were supposed to, uh, that you might like to talk about. So one of them is three things here, review, uh, re review research on the linkages between growing up in poverty and uh, uh, outcomes as both children and later as an adult. I'm not going to take the time to talk about that today. Read it if you're interested. It's one of the chapters. Not surprisingly, we uh, found that growing up in uh, poverty as a child does have uh, deleterious outcomes and effects, uh, both as a child as an adult. Uh, the only contribution of that chapter is to really use the best evidence, the most rigorous a randomized controlled trial and natural experiment evidence, not just correlation, but causation. And we actually have some numbers associated with that. So if you're interested, uh, please read that. But I don't have time to talk about today as much as I would like to. Um, oh, sorry, let me finish the charge here. Number two is assess the poverty reducing impacts of existing programs. So how much do the programs we have right now reduce poverty. And the most important one is the third one, provide a list of alternative evidence-based policies and programs that can reduce child poverty and, and deep poverty uh, by 50 percent within 10 years. So let me parse this for a minute because that's the most important thing. First of all, uh, alternative evidence. We were not asked to recommend anything to, to anybody. We were asked to simply do some calculations and see if we could find some policies that would, would achieve this goal. Whether Congress the President, the United States wants to do it, is up to them. We didn't say do this. We said if you want to reduce child poverty, here are a couple of ways you could do it. So that's important. Uh, second, evidence base is very important there. We had a group of people on this committee who were uh, coming from research backgrounds, and it was very, very important for us to say there has to be strong, strong evidence before we're going to uh, provide any alternative and for all our calculations. Uh, lots of interesting programs out there that we did not choose to 
uh, present as an alternative. Why? Because there's not enough evidence. We simply didn't look at it if, it, uh, if the evidence wasn't there. Secondly, uh, reduce child poverty by 10 years, uh, by 50% within 10 years. Well, 10 years, from my point of view, is like tomorrow. And uh, we, that means a short run here. And uh, immediately, I have to say here that we reluctantly had to rule off the board completely any policies related to uh, child uh, development, uh, especially infant development, early child education, preschool, all those things. And basically, K to 12, we just said, that's, that's got to probably going to be more than 10 years. So a lot of very important discussions are going on in the United States now, and maybe here as well, about hum early child development, human capital investments when you're young, and all the things we might do to help that. We couldn't uh, look at those. So it's really short run stuff. As by and large, as a general rule, we didn't do too much on human capital in general, even for adults. We have one job training program I'll talk about that we did uh, pick as one of our alternatives to simulate the effects on poverty, but otherwise, not a lot on um, uh, human capital. So uh, um, maybe we can talk about that in the Q&A. Anyway, in February, we did release our report. Here's the URL for it. Uh, it's a 600-page report, <laughs> uh, but fortunately, most of that is appendices for all the wonks out there who really want to grind through the numbers. Uh, the chapters themselves are pretty short. We meant it to be readable, so please go there. There's also a Twitter uh, feed, pound child poverty uh, in half, if you uh, want to go through it. That's kind of died out now, but uh, there's a long history there. So anyway, uh, so it's plenty for you to read if, you, if you'd like to. So, um, so what are the... What am I going to do here? I'm going to talk about those two things. One is uh, uh, how much um, uh, current programs reduce child poverty in the United States, and then secondly, what were these alternatives we proposed that might cut child poverty by 50% within 10 years? Now, I'm going to start off as briefly, however, just re uh, reviewing poverty in the United States and what it is, and this is, Mark showed a little bit of this already. Uh, uh, one of the things I've got to emphasize is that we have two poverty lines in the United States. One is the official poverty measure, and one is called the Supplemental Poverty Measure, the SPM. The official poverty measure is still the one that is used by the Census and the Congress to uh, measure child poverty, uh, the po poverty in general and child poverty in particular. It's an absolute poverty line that was set in 1963 and has only been adjusted for inflation since then. Uh, the other one is called the Supplemental Poverty Measure. It's supplemental because the Census Bureau calculates it, but it's not used for any purpose in Congress or uh, to design programs or set thresholds for poverty programs or anything else. Uh, and this measure uh, is much superior by the view of most, almost all analysts uh, to the official poverty measure. It's a kind of a quasi-relative measure, which I could talk about in detail if you'd like. But it does uh, uh, get adjusted over time in changes for living standards, unlike, and, uh, unlike the absolute poverty line or any po poverty line, and therefore unlike the official poverty line. Um, and it includes more types of income, just superior in many other ways. It's a political fact that the Congress refuses to adopt this uh, supplemental poverty measure as the official poverty measure. So uh, let's leave it at that. So uh, anyway, we use the, the, be the better one <laughs> by uh, the view of all the analysts, the sup supplemental poverty measure. So everything I'm going to do here is going to show that. Right now, at least a couple of years ago, 2017, the threshold for a family of four, which uh, according to the SPM measure, was about 27,000 US, which I think is a little bit higher in Canadian dollars. So it gives you some kind of sense of what we're talking about here. Uh, OK, so uh, uh, first of all, what are the poverty rates? 2015, 30% of all US children lived in families that were poor, uh, about 9.6 million children. So in the committee's view, in a lot of people's view, that's too, way too high. Uh, we want to reduce that. Uh, I said we had a little bit of a, um, a section in the report on comparisons to other countries, uh, and it's very difficult to do uh, as compared to other countries because you can't just go out and use the poverty line that other people use because they're all defined differently. And it's not just a matter of having different thresholds, but what they take out, what they include in income, what they take out, what they deduct, what they add to income is different. We did do a little bit of a calculation where we took our SPM, the US SPM, we went to the Luxembourg Income Study uh, data, the LIS, and we tried to kind of do something at least comparable to our definition of the SPM. And we came up with Canada about 9%, something like that, of a poverty rate. So that's kind of comparable, so lower, okay, uh, of, of children too, not, not overall poverty uh, in Canada. Um, we also found, and this is a kind of a, for students of the poverty line, that when you compare the US 
to European countries and Canada by an absolute poverty measure, uh, we do much better than in relative poverty. Relative poverty means that we have so much inequality that our poor families are way, way away from the median and from uh, the higher income families. But the U.S. is also a very high income country uh, on average. The median income is very high. So if you just look at the dollars being received by uh, the poor in the United States, they're not actually that far, far below some of the poor in Europe, for example. Anyway, lots of footnotes there. Uh, okay, so um, poverty rates by race, ethnicity. Uh, this is uh, shown repeatedly by many other people, but we did our own calculations showing that uh, by race and ethnicity, the highest poverty rates are among Hispanics in the United States, about 21.7%. Again, these are children, not all overall. Uh, so one in five, that's pretty high. 17.8 uh, for our African Americans and, uh, and about 7.9% for uh, non-Hispanic, uh, non-African American. Deep poverty rates show the same pattern, but are lower. Okay, so um, this graph, what's been the trend in the United States? Uh, supplemental poverty measures in that dark line. Uh, we started off at 28.4% back in the 1960s, or 1968 about, and it's now, not now, about 2017, uh, uh, down to about 15.6%. So we have had a reduction, I, you know, there is a reason for all these jiggles in the graph there. Back in the 60s and 70s, we had a very strong economy, and we brought a lot of new transfer programs online. The party rate went down. And then we hit a recession in the 1980s, which pushed it up. Uh, then it started gradually dropping down. Around the 1990s, there was another sharp drop because of welfare reform, because of our earned income tax credit, uh, and because of another other, other expansions of programs. It dropped a lot, and but it has, Mark kind of mentioned this, in the United States it has leveled off, uh, so that black line is kind of flat. It has been pretty much since 2000, unlike Canada where it's continued to go down. One of the things we took away from this, by the way, for the purposes of our report, which how do we reduce poverty by 50%, we started off at 28.4, and now we're down at 15, but we did it, actually, almost, <laughs> you know, by whatever happened here, where there's the combination of the economy and our policies, actually, it, it is feasible, because a lot of people, their response to our committee was, you're never going to do it, 50%, forget it. Well, we had done it uh, by one means or another, so it's not uh, out of the question, so, uh, but maybe nobody here needs to be convinced of that. One other point I'll make before I move on is that uh, this is related also to something Mark talked about. We did a calculation here of how much of the uh, changes in poverty in the United States have been due to changes in people's private earnings. Have their earnings all gone up? So that's driving poverty down, or has it been because of our government transfer programs? And it depends on what time period you're talking about. That red line up at the top is the poverty rate if you only use people's private earnings and private income and didn't include transfers. And you can see that uh, right in the middle there, around 1996, it had a high point and then it dropped drastically. So in fact, because of the combination of a really good economy and the earned income tax credit and welfare reform, earnings actually went way up and they reduced poverty a lot. However, after 2000, it kind of started going up again, and we had a recession, uh, which was very severe in the United States. It's come back down to 25.1. But basically, since 2000, uh, I mean, Mark said we've done better on earnings than Canada has, you know, but we haven't done that great either. It's been, on average, uh, aside from the recessionary jumps up and down, we haven't got much poverty reduction since 2000 out of earnings. Uh, earnings are very low at the bottom, and they haven't been rising. So. Uh, uh, on the other hand, the, as I showed you before, the actual poverty rate, including transfers, has gone way down. It's down to 15.6. So almost all the progress we've made since 2000 in the United States is because of transfers. So that was very important to uh, our goal. Okay, so quickly, uh, what did we find the existing programs uh, in the United States to uh, have uh, as far as their impact and the magnitudes of their impacts on poverty? and I uh, won't spend a lot of time on all the various programs in the United States. Uh, uh, the food stamp program is very important to the United States, our nutrition program. Uh, housing is very important. Uh, we have a lot of important tax credits for workers, earned income tax credit, something called the child, child tax credit. The old aid to families with dependent children program, which is now called TANF, is actually today almost non-existent. I mean, it's, uh, it, it ranks like number seven, number eight, number nine, number 10 in terms of uh, uh, the expenditures. It's almost 
uh, not even worth talking about anymore. It's gone. Uh, the Medicaid program is very, very important. Uh, uh, there's some technical issues here. Uh, I don't know about Canada, but we don't include the Medicaid program in our definition of poverty. It's very difficult to know how to count medical benefits. And in fact, if you're interested in that topic at all, our committee commissioned a report, a very interesting report, on the best way to include medical benefits in a poverty definition. And that paper has gotten a lot of uh, circulation in the United States and raises a lot of very interesting issues. Disability programs, a lot of people receiving disability programs do have children in the family, and so that's a very important program. Anyway, uh, uh, so what can we say about what impact those programs have made uh, on poverty in the United States? The top line there, 13% is our existing program, uh, sorry, uh, 2015 level of child poverty, uh, including transfers, if you just took them all away, zeroed out every major transfer program in the United States, the poverty rate would be 70 uh, percentage points higher, almost about 30 percent. So huge, huge, huge impact uh, it's having on child poverty. Turns out that the major programs that are doing that are our, are our, are our tax credits, the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit, and uh, our food stamp program are the, num uh, the most important ones. Uh, and uh, that was something to take home there, and in fact, that also led us to realize how important they are in reducing poverty and the alternatives we propose, I've proposed in one second here are going to definitely include expansions of those two programs as a way to reduce poverty. Um, we also saw some deep poverty rates. Uh, the deep poverty rate was half, if you don't know, deep poverty is one half the fraction of families with uh, incomes below one half of the threshold, uh, only 2.9 percent, but it would be 13 percentage points higher without all the programs. So uh, obviously, uh, progr uh, current programs are very important. Okay, what about uh, our main charge here? Could we find program or uh, a program or set of programs which would, uh, according to our calculations, uh, reduce child poverty by 50 percent, pretty much in short run, without long run impacts? And uh, we spent a lot of time on this. And we went and we uh, asked 15 or 20 experts around the United States to write us papers. What are your ideas? Uh, give us your list. And people would you know, give us all their ideas. Uh, we uh, had a bunch of uh, public forums where we asked people to come in, give us your ideas. And then, of course, we as experts and committee follow the discussions very closely. And we knew a lot of programs that were um, out there. And uh, we came up with 20, really 10, but we had a high, a different levels, variations within each of the 10. So we came up with 20. And I should say we came up with our 20 without calculating the effects on poverty, just on basis of what we know and our evidence, uh, what ones uh, have a promise. And we use a lot of criteria here, the most important criteria. Did we think the evidence supports the uh, projection that these programs would reduce poverty by 50 percent? But it wasn't just that. We had other criteria. For example, in the United States, employment and work incentives are very, very important. And so we wanted to bring that in somehow and decide, well, let's have some programs in there which would definitely have some work incentives. We wanted to have uh, things like effects on marriage, another big issue in the United States, maybe uh, uh, things that might encourage marriage or at least not discourage it. Uh, we had other criteria for social inclusion and things like that, which, which all were kind of factored in in our choices of programs, even though poverty reduction was the most important. Anyway, so I'll take one second here to list these uh, <clears throat> and um, which ones we came up with. These are the, the 10, and we, like I said, we have variations on each one. Up on the left are program, we grouped them. So the programs up to the left are all programs which had a, would have not only poverty reduction, but hopefully a major impact on employment and work incentives. And number one in that is expanding our earned income tax credit. Number two is expanding our child uh, care sub subsidies. And I could go into the detail, I'm happy the Q&A to go into the details exact, we, we were very specific about how we wanted to do each one of these. Um, and uh, I could talk about that in great detail. Minimum wage, we also tried Minimum wage has been dropping in real, the federal minimum wage has been dropping in real terms for a long time, a lot of movement and interest in raising that <clears throat> in the United States right now. And then a training, we did come up with one training program called Work Advance, uh, which was rather difficult to come up with because, uh, uh, again, I could talk about this in quite length, but 
we would all like great job training programs to increase the human capital of disadvantaged workers and to raise their earnings in the first place. Unfortunately, uh, as we kind of knew already, but when we review the literature, at least in U.S. training programs, based upon very rigorous evaluations, randomized controlled trials, the evidence is dismal, okay, really dismal. And uh, it's very, very, we've had a very difficult time uh, finding programs that would increase the earnings of disadvantaged workers from very much for very long. They tend to not do, uh, raise earnings for very much, and then they kind of phase out, very, they disappear very quickly. Uh, and uh, we found one program uh, uh, called Work Advance, which has uh, for the promise of pretty major increases, uh, $1,500 to $2,000 a year, and uh, as far as we can tell, might last a while. Uh, the lower left, I won't talk a lot about immigration, of course, the big issue in the United States. Undocumented immigrants in the United States are basically not eligible for anything. So we wanted to kind of simulate what the impact of reversing that would be. And secondly, if you're not aware of this, a lot of legal immigrants also are not eligible for programs uh, for at least a certain period. Most commonly, there's a five-year waiting period after you enter the United States, even if you enter legally, uh, before you're eligible for these programs. So we simulated the effect of basically reversing all those current policies. Up to the right, we're taking current programs and expanding them. Our, our supplemental nutrition assistance program, that's the food stamp program, uh, had a lot of, uh, that, that seems to have a great poverty impact, so, uh, and a lot of families run out of their food before the end of the, uh, food stamps before the end of the month. Uh, housing choice voucher program, we have a subsidized housing program. It's rationed, there are only a certain number of housing slots made available, so there are long waiting lists for those programs. You can be on the waiting list for two, three, four, five years before you get offered a rental unit. Uh, expand that one. Uh, supplemental security income, that's uh, for mainly for the disabled uh, uh, families with children, and those benefits are relatively low, so we um, expanded that one. And then most importantly, the lower, lower right call, uh, named policies used in other countries. Uh, so there's a child tax credit uh, there, which we have right now, but it's rather modest. And we wanted to repl uh, replace that by a nearly universal child allowance. So that's the closest thing we came up with, uh, closest thing the Canadian child benefits that. It's not near universal. In fact, I was kind of comparing it to yours last night. And uh, this thing we proposed is less in terms of dollars. The dollars is only about 3,700 Canadian, I think, per child. Uh, and I think yours is higher than that. However, it phases out at a much higher level than your, yours does. And I think up around, ours phases out, start, doesn't even, when we propose, doesn't start phasing out until about 75,000 uh, Canadian. And I think uh, up at that range, actually, ours would be a little bit more generous than the Canadian one. Anyway, but it's also not universal. We did phase it out, it phased it out completely, about 100,000 uh, Canadian. Um, so uh, th that was one. And then the last one, there's a child support assurance. We have a big problem here that absent fathers uh, hardly pay anything in the low-income community, and there's been long-standing proposals for the government to come in and say if the absent father does not provide the child support to the children uh, that he's fathered, uh, then the government will step in and top it up uh, for the mother so that the children can receive uh, an adequate uh, income. Okay, so anyway, uh, so let me quickly give you the results here and tell you what we found. Number one, uh, we went through all those programs. We had 10 and uh, high and low variation in each one of them. And that's a little hard to read. If you look over in the right-hand column there, it shows the percentage point reduction uh, in poverty from each of these policies we came up with. Uh, we, were, we start off at 13% poverty, so we're trying to get down to like 6.5%. And none of these programs got to the 6.5%. So none of the ones we picked out. And maybe we should have gone back and you know, increased the benefits uh, of them or somehow manipulated them. We didn't think that was kind of kosher. We didn't want to kind of, uh, uh, kind of just manipulate the programs. We took a different approach, as I'll say in one second. The bigger one, or the green line, all kind of three-fourths the way down there, uh, is minus 5.3 percentage points. That's the child benefit, <laughs> okay, the child allowance. That's the one that had the biggest single impact. And uh, we're certainly going to continue to, uh, in the next few slides, uh, include that one. Up there, second one from the top, 2.1%. The earned income tax credit, uh, we proposed a pretty significant increase in that. That got you 2.1%. By the way, none of these things, <laughs> we'd be happy with any 2.1% or 5.3%. We were told you got to get to 50%, and so we had to keep going. You know, we couldn't stop here. Uh, but uh, anyway, that's what we found. We, uh, were very, we were told to calculate the cost of these programs, and we have a graph here where all the horizontal is how many children are uh, taken out of poverty, on the vertical is the cost. 
and the line has a positive slope. <laughs> so the more money you spend, uh, the more, um, uh, I mean, sorry, the, the more money you spend, the more children you take out of poverty and vice versa. Uh, that, par that, that child allowance, that child benefit that had a major impact is all the way up there at the top on the right, about, um, uh, you know, about uh, 50 billion US. So what is that, about 65 billion Canadian. Uh, uh, so, you know, cost money to do that. Okay, so and we, we're trying to shy from that. Our goal was to tell Congress, you want to do this? Here's how much it costs. And to actually come up with some numbers here uh, that we thought were halfway reliable. I won't talk about how we, we, we spent a huge amount of time simulating these numbers and trying to get the, the, as closely to accurate as we could. Employment, we made a lot of time on work incentives here. Uh, uh, one of the committee members, Hillary Hoynes, and I are, we're the most expert in knowing the research literature on what the uh, research shows as far as the work incentives of the programs. And uh, we concluded that the evidence shows that some programs do reduce work and others increase work. And we went through all those programs and we applied the existing research literature to each one of them and calculated <coughs> the employment impacts. And we did find that some of the pr uh, proposals that we had uh, come up with would reduce uh, work incentives and reduce employment. Uh, but the work-based ones, we increase them by even more. And uh, as I'll come to a second here, that's gonna, that, that was something we really made use of because we wanted to have a net increase in employment <laughs> uh, for my, many reasons in the United States. We wanted to propose things that were not going to have a major reduction in employment. We didn't think that that would be very re uh, received well. Uh, okay, so what we did was, instead of going back to those programs and just increasing the generosity of a bunch of them, we said, why don't we put together some packages here? And it wasn't just because we wanted to get the 50% reduction. We also thought that these packages, uh, the idea of packages here, is that you, you, know, you really want a lot of different kind of programs that cover different kind of needs and help different kind of people. You want to have some programs that help people who are able to work and supplement their incomes. You want to have some programs that help people who can't or have barriers to work and aren't working. Uh, you want to help their housing. You want to help their food. You want to give them some cash, too. You have a lot of different goals here. And probably the best way to achieve that is to have not just find one program, but have a whole bunch of them. So that's exactly what we did next. And <clears throat> here's what we did. We have four quote unquote packages. The one up, uh, I'm gonna show first is called a work oriented package. So if all you care about is employment <laughs> and you wanna maximize that, we said, well, why don't you try the earned income tax credit, expand child care subsidies, uh, increase the minimum wage. These are all work based and have a training program. And uh, we did, we added all those, we costed it all out. And down at the bottom here, which you may or may not be able to read, have about a minus 18.8% reduction in poverty uh, and an increase in employment of about a million jobs. So these are gonna be the maximum employment impact, uh, but we only got to 18%. I say only, because I say, geez, if we could reduce uh, child poverty by, by uh, uh, one fifth, I'd, I'd be very happy to do that. But anyway, we had to keep going because of our charge. Uh, we then came up with another policy where we said, well, we add in that that great uh, child benefit, <laughs> you know, that it has some impact, and keep a couple of the most important work programs, which are the earned income tax credit and child care subsidy. You combine those three, actually, you get a much bigger, minus 35%, uh, you get almost a 50%, well, you know, two thirds of the way there, you get a big reduction, uh, it costs more, 44 billion US, uh, and uh, you do get an increase in employment, but not as much as you did if you only did the work things. So there's the trade-off okay? uh, between poverty reduction and employment and costs. And then we came up with uh, two more packages here that, um, let's see, it doesn't seem to show the lines. I'm not sure exactly why, okay. Uh, which uh, co combined and did get us to 50%. The third column there combines those two employment programs, the earned income tax credit and the child care subsidies with uh, uh, two of our existing programs, expanding housing and uh, expanding uh, 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 food stamp program, the fourth column. Uh, doesn't increase the housing programs and the uh, uh, food stamp, but add down to bottom, most importantly, add the child benefit. And you, for both of those programs, the um, next column shows that the reductions in poverty are minus 50%, and so we got there. <laughs> Here's a, if you, that's your only goal, I guess I gotta keep saying, the other things are important too. You get poverty reduction. Uh, this is what you should do. Uh, you get net increases in employment. Uh, like I said, that's very important in the US for both of these programs 
because those work programs have such a big impact on employment. The cost is, uh, you know, from 90 to 108 uh, billion. So multiply that by, you know, a third, uh, one and a third to get uh, Canadians. So uh, these uh, were regarded as expensive programs, although I got to say some of our Democrats in Congress uh, have proposed things cost even more. Uh, so that's the cost uh, the numbers there. Um, and lessons, you know, building a combination of work support, uh, in oriented and income support programs can reduce poverty and increase employment. That was kind of the headline that we came up with, and so we we're putting those out there. So anyway, we have another chapter. I invite you to read it all about, this is great, all these design programs. What about down on the ground? You know, when you have people who have uh, unstable and predictable incomes, uh, do they have access to the programs on the ground? How do you make sure they can get the programs that, that, um, that they're, they're eligible for and there aren't administrative barriers? We have a whole long discussion of that, uh, and I don't have time for it, but I invite you to read that chapter <coughs> if you're interested in more of a kind of an on-the-ground view of how to do this. So I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>